Okay, Stephanie's here. Okay, great. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our Boston Police for hosting today for a very exciting announcement about steps forward and the community leaders will be part of our efforts to continue bringing accountability and transparency to policing and public safety in Boston. I am joined here by several leaders you will hear from shortly and members who will be serving on two of the, the boards that we're very excited to be filling as well as colleagues in government, Councilor Ricardo Arroyo and Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson who I'll invite up to speak in a minute as well. I also want to recognize our partners uh, on this effort specifically around accountability, transparency, and bringing the reforms that will build trust in community here from the Boston Police Department, Deputy Superintendent Eddie Crispin from Internal Affairs, as well as Superintendent Sharon Doughton, Chief of the Bureau of Professional Standards. Thank you for your leadership. This has been a long time coming, and this has been the result of decades of advocacy from community leaders and leadership from now three different administrations, specifically on setting up the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. This is an effort from the 11-member uh, group on the Boston Police Reform Task Force that was convened under Mayor Walsh, including uh, a member who will be joining our IUP board today. And one of the signature recommendations of that group was to form an Office of Police Accountability and Transparency, also known as OPAP. In December of 2020, I'm proud that the City Council moved forward with codifying that with the explicit purpose of strengthening the relationship between Boston Police and our communities by incre increasing trust, transparency, and accountability. Since then, under the leadership of Executive Director Stephanie Everett of the OPAT, we have seen important strides forward in advancing that work at BPD and at the City of Boston. Today, I'm excited to announce our latest steps in moving that work forward with new appointments to fill OPAT's Civilian Review Board, as well as the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, IOP. The nine-person Civilian Review Board is charged with reviewing and investigating complaints against the Boston Police Department and its employees. To carry out this important work, I'm very honored and excited to appoint uh, nine members who I will, will read now. Chair of the CRB will be Peter Alvarez, former BPS school teacher and lawyer providing pro bono education related counsel, well-known community leader involved in many efforts in, in our communities. Natalie Carrithers, a former chief of staff in the Massachusetts House of Representatives with a background in healthcare and civil rights. The Reverend Wayne S. Daly, well known to many of us for his work in assisting young people returning to communities after periods of incarceration. Joshua Dankoff, a child welfare, juvenile justice, and immigration policy advocate. Anne Hernandez, a social worker supporting immigrant students and wearing many hats in our community. Carrie Mays, a local organizer and activist involved in the arts and many other causes who has become such a fierce advocate in driving our city forward. She will serve as the board's dedicated youth member to represent the voices and experiences of young people across Boston and in many of our communities. Amy McNamee, a criminal defense attorney who works on various violent and financial crimes cases. Tara Register, an advocate and organizer focused on creating youth wellness through comprehensive systems of family support. And Chris Sumner, an advocate who has led many community organizations in Boston, including Upward Bound and the Salvation Army's Ray and Joan Kroc Center. Now, the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, or IOP, is responsible for reviewing investigations completed by BPD's Internal Affairs Division. The panel is made up of five members. The chair will be Judge Leslie Harris. We are so grateful that he is continuing to, where is Judge? <laughs> right behind me. Uh, continuing to serve in this role. Former Associate Justice for the Suffolk Juvenile Court, who will serve as chair. Allison Cartwright, attorney in charge at the Roxbury Defender's Office, and an original member of the Boston Police Reform Task Force that advise the creation of this group. Christina Miller, an assistant clinical professor of law at Suffolk University, who also served as chief of district courts and community prosecutions with the Suffolk County DA's office. Julian Mundell, an attorney specializing in government investigations, criminal defense and health law practice, and a former ADA with the Suffolk County DA's office. And Jesse Fred Fredcia Senwa, an advocate from the Suffolk County DA's office and organizer around domestic violence. With these appointments, we are strengthening OPAT's commitment 
to creating clear channels of accountability to build a safer, stronger city for all of us. As an entity entirely independent from the Boston Police, OPAT is a community-driven resource for achieving real accountability within our police department. I'm excited that the new data dashboard is now officially up and running as of very recently, and so you can find reports fully open to the public on uh, police interactions within the community, as well as statistics related to complaints at boston.gov slash OPAP. You can also access and file a complaint at that same website. We are also in the midst of many ongoing steps related to public safety and leadership in our city. So the OPAT will coordinate closely with our next police commissioner. The incoming commissioner will play a critical role in continuing efforts to build a public safety infrastructure addressing the systemic causes of crime and criminalization, not just the symptoms. Our commissioner search is continuing to be informed by residents across the city and, and key leaders and stakeholders. We've held two public community meetings so far, last Thursday and just yesterday. And if you couldn't make it to either one of these community listening sessions, we still want to make sure we're getting your feedback. You can submit a survey with your personal experiences and input and feedback at boston.gov slash BPD commissioner. That survey is available in English, Haitian Creole, Spanish, Arabic, Cabo Verdean Creole, Chinese, French, Portuguese, Russian, Somali, and Vietnamese. In closing, I want to re reiterate that every resident in every corner of every neighborhood in our city must feel safe, deserves to feel safe, to be safe in the knowledge that our police department will uphold its responsibility to serve and protect. That requires building trust, which begins and ends with community. So with our search for a new police commissioner underway and our appointees to OPAT in place, we are ready to transform the structures of public safety and change the culture of policing in Boston. Um, I will hand it over to a few other speakers first and then um, give an overview in Espanol. So next I will pass it on to Stephanie Everett, Executive Director of the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome to our board members. Uh, when I first started this position nine months ago, I was a party of one. Um, I thankfully in the last four months have grown to a party of eight and we're still growing, so please look on um, the website if you have any good people. Um, for some, the creation of OPAT was a direct result of a singular incident that occurred thousands of miles away and that such acts did not happen here in Boston. Um, this sentiment was echoed in many of the newspapers, on our social media feeds, and just as much in news articles that predated my appointment regarding the past incidents of police officers, criminals' behaviors that were found sustained that allowed them to stay on the force. All these incidents did not happen in one day and will not be resolved in one day. We actually have reports that go back to 1992 about things that needed to change in this city. But we know that BPD is more than one incident or a couple of incidents, and we can be more for ourselves and they can be more for themselves and for the community they, just, they serve. OPAT and its boards have a big role to play in investigating complaints, reviewing internal affairs investigations, but also in creating some real positive changes in policies with defined procedures that will address promotions within BPD for its BIPOC employees and build trust internally and externally. For us to get there, it will not be achieved in a short period of time, but with constant, committed, and purposeful effort to build trust, rebuild trust, and it will require some of us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable as we do the work together. With the boards now fully seated, I am eager to work with, to get the work going, and we have a lot of work to do. To my members, I say this to you specifically as we begin this work. When I first started my job, I was tasked with a lot of things according to a lot of people, um, and so despite what everyone thought my first task was on my first day, my real task was for me to identify why I was doing this work. I imagined the complaints would not be easy to hear, the results 
what may not also be what either side may want, and I knew that I would have to make some, un some unhappy, and I was going to have to be all right with some of these decisions because in order to get the work done, you have to be fair and impartial to move the work forward. But throughout my nine months, I maintained my purpose for accepting this role. And for me, that purpose has been finding my, has been my community, my sons, my daughters, and my husband. And that's what I needed to succeed in this office for the last month. I know that OPAD is bigger than my individual feelings about any negative article, quote, or opinion that has ever been written or said about this office. I know that there are people who need to see this office dis succeed despite or sometimes in spite of what others say or what others feel. There are not so many offices that you can think of that people actually died for this place to exist. And for that, this is the work that you are going to do. So as you take your steps into this office, and as everyone's looking on, I ask you to find your purpose and center yourself in it as you move forward in this work. So in the words of the late, great Congressman John Lewis, I look forward to getting into some good trouble with each of you, <laughs> creating some safe spaces for people to share their stories, to start building on the trust, rebuilding trust in other spaces, and I'll see you all at work. Next up, and I'm, ex um, I'm excited that Councillor Kendra Lara has also joined us, and uh, we'll hear from her as well. Uh, but first up, before I turn it over to um, the elected officials, I'm going to introduce Judge Leslie Harris, who will be chair of the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, then Peter Alvarez, who will chair the Civilian Review Board, and then a few of our cabinet members who are here as well. Judge? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm excited about this. A bit nervous, but excited. Accountability and transparency. Those are the important words that I want my community to hear. We will be open, we will be willing to talk with you, and we will be accessible. I thank the panel that created this board. Um, Wayne Bird was one of my law professors, one of my mentors. Jamal Crawford, although he's younger than me, is one of my mentors. And I look forward to making sure that their work is fulfilled, that they're not disappointed, that we don't let them down. I am honored to be working with this panel. I know so many of these people. I've seen them in the community. I know their commitment to the community. I know that they're not out to hang anybody. You know, um, we are out to do justice. That has been my lifelong work. It is what I'm looking forward to. It is what I'm hoping that all parties involved will understand that we're looking for justice for our community and for the police officers who come in front of us. My older brother, who just passed on December 23rd, was a Chicago police officer and sergeant for 20, 30 something years. He was then a police chief and a police commissioner. My father was an MP. My brother-in-law was a Michigan State Lieutenant. I come from a family um, loaded with police officers. I've watched good police officers. I know what they look like. But I've also been the victim of violence by police. I carry a scar on my head from when I was 12 or 13 years old that first introduced me to policing in my community. And I don't want that to continue. I want us to be able to rely on our police officers, to be able to trust our police officers, and to be able to support our police officers. So that's my commitment, that I will work towards that, that I will support this committee, this panel, this board, you know, and I look forward to the work that we're going to be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Judge Harris. Next up, Chair Peter Alvarez of the Civilian Review Board. Thank you, Mayor Wu, and thank you, AD Stephanie Everett, and all of the panel here, the you know, phenomenal people that we're going to be working with and, and making this happen. Um, this is an honor to be on the Civilian Review Board, but also to serve as its inaugural chair. And I don't take that responsibility lightly. Um, I want to make sure that all Bostonians 
are able to have trust in a system. The CRB looks forward to building an independent accountability infrastructure that for the first time will allow our residents to voice their concerns to an independent body when they feel they've been wronged by law enforcement. And I think that's big for our city. I grew up in Upham's Corner and attended Madison Park Tech Book High School right up the street. I'm a first generation American and spent my developmental years and my early adulthood with an incarcerated father. I've taught middle school in Boston Public Schools and I've worked with youth, uh, in, with and for youth in a lot of different capacities throughout my professional career. And I know the unique challenges and complexities of encounters between police and youth, especially youth of color. Like many Bostonians, I've experienced the duality of needing law enforcement and the apprehension with law enforcement encounters. The first police encounter I remember was when SWAT raided my childhood home after knocking down the door when executing a warrant and I was five years old. I felt the apprehension of a traffic stop more times than I can remember. My role model growing up was my uncle who served on the, proudly on the Boston Police Department until his retirement. Just recently, it was a Boston police officer who responded and provided support to my family when my uncle who suffered from addiction passed away in his sleep. My family have been victims of crime and have relied on law enforcement to find the perpetrators and deliver justice and accountability, and I'm thankful for their service. I say all this to say the issues of the CRB will encounter are complicated and nuanced and deserve complicated and nuanced review and consideration. Impartiality, fairness, accountability, and due process are the bedrock requirements of the CRB. We seek to gain trust in the community, improve law enforcement community relations, and enhance public safety in the process. This will take time and commitment to be achieved, and I'm confident in the members of the CRB, and I'm confident that we'll be able to achieve our goals. I again want to thank Mayor Wu and everyone here today. I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues in the CRB and the OPAT staff. Thank you. I invite up our Senior Advisor for Public Safety, Rufus Falk. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm going to be brief and just say that I'm honored to be here in this moment with, these, with this panel as we begin to reimagine what public safety means and looks like for the city of Boston. Recognizing it's about being inclusive, it's, it's, it's about ensuring that everyone has access and ensuring that Boston has a quality of life equitable across all neighborhoods. So as we begin to reimagine public safety and the services that we deliver, this, this OPAT staff, these panels and these individuals up here are fully committed to ensuring that a person's zip code no longer is going to dictate their quality of life, ensuring that the, the Boston that I grew up in, even though I loved it, it was harsh, but we want to make sure that the Boston that we see in the future is much better for all of our young people. So uh, congratulations to you all, and thank you, Mayor. We we'll appreciate you. We're also joined by our Chief of Community Engagement, who is refusing to be in the front. Come say a few words, Chief Brianna Millor. Hello everyone, Brianna Malor, Chief of Community Engagement. I just want us to think of these two words, accountability and transparency. Those are the words that truly build trust in the communities that we desperately need and we are striving for. Um, the Civilian, Civilian Review Board appointments as long as, uh, alongside IOP and with the leadership of Stephanie Everett of OPAT um, will build that trust within the communities that we desperately need to see. And I'm excited to be a part of this process and make sure to engage with um, some of the great community members that are represented here today. And I look forward to bringing accountability and transparency to the police department. Okay, I'm gonna invite up my, my colleagues on the city council as such an important partnership and really the, the body that made sure that we had legislation codifying this. So starting with Council Ricardo Arroyo. Thank you, Mayor Wu. Uh, this is really a great day uh, for the city of Boston. This is the culmination of decades of work uh, by hundreds of people. Uh, this is the manifestation of a community-led process to ensure that no one is above the law, that no one is beyond accountability. We know, uh, I think we've had several people now share the stories in which we've seen these dual realities of officers who go above and beyond and officers who don't, uh, who sometimes have interactions uh, with the community that actually lead to harm for both the department for other officers and, and for the community themselves. And this is the creation of a manifestation of a body that is going to ensure that we have a responsible, clear, open, non-biased way 
of ensuring that people are held accountable when those interactions occur and that we are creating a community-led process that creates the kind of trust that helps officers when they are doing their jobs, that helps the community engage with officers, helps the community engage with those who are there to serve them, uh, and have full faith and trust that if something happens that should not happen, that is beyond the pale or, 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 or illegal or in any way, shape, or form excessive, that there is a, man there's a way for them to manifest that camp complaint in a way that will be heard. Uh, we know that over the last several decades that has not been the case, and so today is a great day uh, for the city of Boston because we now have a way to do that. So I'm grateful to uh, Mayor Michelle Wu. I'm grateful to those who came before who, who pushed for this to happen, uh, whether it was the council this year or the council 20 years ago where I believe this was first proposed as, a, as an idea. I also want to take this moment to thank this board, which has been excellently, these two boards that have been excellently selected. Uh, many of these uh, folks are leaders in their communities, respectively. Uh, many of these folks have reputations that precede them uh, in terms of how they go about their work. Uh, and so I am grateful to them for accepting the charge. Uh, this is, to me, a great day for public safety because this board will enhance public safety by enhancing the trust and respect and reputation of BPD uh, and the officers who are serving us daily with the community. So this is a great day, and I'm grateful to you all for accepting this really important charge. Councilor Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. Good afternoon, uh, and to all uh, concerned stakeholders and community members. It is with great honor that I'm here today. Um, thank you, Mayor Wu, so much for um, inviting me to participate. Um, so uh, the issue with police accountability and transparency is one that is integral to signif and significant for our city and society at large. Such a process implemented in a deep and transformative manner can begin a process of healing uh, for all and can be better created um, conditions to trust moving forward. As we seek improved relations between police and community members, such a process must be thorough and honestly engaged in. Less, we reproduce structures of systemic racism and feed into pre-existing feelings of bitterness built up by generations of problematic inter interactions between the police and residents. However, through this process currently being engaged, we can alter this narrative. A police department, Boston Police Department, working with the people can make us all proud. Furthermore, a legitimate process in place that demonstrates that officers are being transparent in their work and that they are held accountable when they do not uphold the high standards we all expect them to. With that being said, um, it can help bring all officer and resident alike the beginnings of a strong and healthy process of policing in Boston. I'm one that look forward, I look forward to working with the constituents in District 7 and Boston at large to be able to create more accountability through my office and understanding, educating, and engagement. Um, and as I always say, whatever way that I can be helpful, um, and that I look forward to doing that and working with the board. I'm so proud of you, Carrie, to see you here um, and look forward to supporting um, as much as possible. Um, also, I want to express that I feel that beyond coming from someone who's worked in the public health sector with mental health, I feel that we also have a lot of work to do with our fellow uh, brothers and sisters, officers who risk their lives to be out in the streets and work every day. And with that, I look forward to partnership with youth and building relationship with that as well to uphold accountability. Thank you so much. Councillor Kendra Lara. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Mayor Wu, um, for your introduction. Uh, congratulations to all of the members of the Incoming Civilian Review Board. Uh, for four years, I served in the city of Boston as a street worker in Lower Roxbury um, and in the South End. And for those four years, I dedicated myself to working with young people who were gang involved and serving as an advocate for them at schools and in the courthouse. And so for most of my life, I have been intimately familiar with the impact uh, of what it looks like when we don't center community in our decisions around police and policing. And so today, this is a celebratory day for me. And I would be remiss to also not say that in these conversations around community accountability, in these conversations around police and policing, 
people who are formerly incarcerated, their family members, and those who have had to bear the brunt of um, the systemic ills of police and policing as we know them today, continue to be underrepresented in our decision-making processes. And it's my hope that the formation of the Civilian Review Board is one step into remedying that and getting closer to a world where communities get to decide what safety means for them and what accountability looks like inside of their neighborhoods. And so to each member of the Civilian Review Board, congratulations. I've heard lots of mention of being an impartial body today. And I want to offer that you are not impartial, that you stand firmly on the side of justice in your role. And I thank you for making a decision to serve the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I know um, this has been a significant speaking program. I do want to create space for any of the board members no pressure, uh, but to come up, I've in introduced everyone and given quick highlights of, of your resumes and, and some of your amazing qualifications. Um, but if anyone would like to come up and just offer some brief words on what drives you, or um, please feel free. Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Carrie Mays. Thank you, Mayor Wu. Um, as a young person, I deeply appreciate this opportunity. Um, beyond measure, you know, I come from both worlds of having positive experiences with the police. I've done years worth of hosting community police dialogues, youth police basketball tournaments, and also I've had negative experiences with the police, of which were very traumatic and almost costed me my life as a black woman. So essentially, I think what this means is to do something that has never been done before, um, I think what this means, we can be a national model for what reciprocal accountability means and also, most of all, bring about change and solutions for our city because that's what it's really about. So, thank you. Greetings. Thank you, Mayor Wu. I do want to uh, bring highlight to how comprehensive the interview process was. Um, just to give the community the context of what we've all been through in this process. Um, and the reason I'm committed to, obviously, uh, of my history here in the city of Boston and haven't had some negative experiences with police as well as positive. But historically, I do want to celebrate those who pulled this committee together, the, the interview process, was very comprehensive, very reflective, very historic, and I celebrate you and being courageous in pulling this off. God bless. Ann Hernandez. You know, when you um, sit and you st stand here and you listen and you're going, oh shoot, I really, I'm really part of this. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling. You know, as a social worker who has two siblings who are police officers, you know, I've definitely seen um, the police officers who do their job and do it thoroughly and the police officers who don't. And I think as a, as a mental health provider, I'm always trying to figure out, well, what is it? Because for me, it's not so much the action, but the intention behind it. And I'm hoping that I can bring that lens as we review these cases and try to figure out what are the parties that need support and need help? Because this is not about good cop, bad cop, good civilian, bad civilian, but somebody mentioned something about healing. And hopefully, this is an opportunity to look at the entire system so that we're not pinning it against each other, but finding the ways in which we can create structures and systems that support in the long term something that it's really lasting and sustainable. So I'm honored, I'm still in shock. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, um, to see how it all unfolds. And um, thank you for allowing me in this space. Ms. Natalie Carrither. Hi. Welcome, fellow board members. I look forward to working with all of you. Um, I have always been an advocate for social justice. Uh, my first experience with the police department, actually being born here in Boston, Boston City Hospital. It's, been, it's evolved since then. <laughs> um, and being a public, Boston Public School graduate. 
having my school surrounded by people with bats and clubs and bottles, having to go to school my freshman year, and my family were workers, and they stressed the importance of your job ethic. And one thing my mother wanted, she wanted a Thunderbird. Well, my mama got her a Thunderbird, and it was, oh, lavender, okay? I came home my freshman year for the weekend. I said, Ma, can I borrow your car? She said, yeah. You know, here are the keys. But what I didn't play in, what I didn't realize, that I had cut all my hair off. And I looked like a little boy with a short afro. I was driving down American Legion Highway, Flashing blue lights went off. I said, what the heck did I do? I didn't do anything. It's what they perceived me to be doing. He got to the window and says the usual line, license and registration. And then he looked at me. He said, oh, you're a girl. <laughs> I said, yes. What did I do wrong? Oh, nothing. I'm sorry and they drove off. These are just instances, or when my brother, who's no longer here, had a mental health issue at our house, and we had to call 911. They sent the police. There were eight policemen that tackled my brother in the driveway to try to restrain him. There had to be another way. There's no compassion. We're lacking so much in a lot of areas. But with this, I know I'm going to play a part in this. I want to ensure that our voices are heard because we have gone through too much for too long. And I appreciate Michelle. Oh, we know. <laughs> Never mind. But um, thank you for considering me. And it's my honor. No? Okay. All right. Um, okay. I want to just make sure we're communicating a few pieces that are important. Um, Estamos aquí hoy um, anunciando unos, unos pasos importantes de, de la um, acuantabilidad para el sistema de, de salud pública y seguridad pública con um, las recomendaciones y líderes en, en los roles del uh, Civilian Review Board y también um, IAP. Um, en este momento, Es importante de cada residente, cada, cada familia tiene acceso a las opciones para crear cambio en, en esos sistemas en nuestra comunidad. Um, para es, a, hacer ese importante trabajo en, el, en la Junta de Revisión Civil, los miembros nuevos son Peter Alvarez, Natalie Carrithers, Reverend Wayne S. Daly, Joshua Denkoff, Ann Hernandez, Carrie Mays, Amy McNary, Tara Register, and Chris Sumner. Uh, y Chris, Chris Sumner. Y el um, panel de supervisión de asuntos internos, IAP, se encarga de revisar las investigaciones realizadas por la División de Asuntos Internos de, de, de la de Policía. El cuerpo tendrá cinco miembros, Alison Cartwright, La jueza Leslie Harris, Christina Miller, Julian Mandel, y Jassy Fredzia Senwa. Um, también quiero mencionar que la OPAT se coordinará de manera importante con nuestro próximo comisionado de polic policía. El siguiente comisionado tendrá un papel fundamental en nuestros continuos esfuerzos por construir una infraestructura de seguridad pública que aborde las causas sistémicas de la delincuencia en lugar de limitarse a los síntomas. 
La comunidad informará el proceso de seleccionar el siguiente comisionado. Y hemos tenido dos reuniones comunitarias todavía y tendremos más en las próximas semanas. También pueden ir a boston.gov slash BPD Commissioner para aprender más sobre el proceso o tomar una encuesta sobre lo que desean ver al siguiente comisionado. Um, cada residente en cada rincón de cada barrio de nuestra ciudad merece sentirse seguro sabiendo que nuestro departamento de policía cumplirá con su responsabilidad de servirles y protegerles. Con la búsqueda de un nuevo comisionado de policía y los nombramientos de la OPAT en marcha, estamos listos para transformar las estructuras de seguridad pública y cambiar la cultura policial en Boston. Gracias. Ok, questions? Preguntas. So what do you envision the next six months to a year looking like for both of these boards and for the OPAT in general? What does the start of this work look like? Ms. Everett. Thank you. So we will have, um, now that we have fully seated boards, the chairs of both the CRB and the IOP make up the OPAC commission. So a lot of times when everyone was talking about what the work was going to be, subpoena power actually resides with the commission. So we will have, we did have a meeting in October. We're having a meeting, I believe I confirmed with everyone, on October 15th for the OPAC commission, which would be myself, um, chair, February 15th. What did I just say? I'm sorry. <laughs> still think. So February 15th, 2022, um, with um, Chair Alvarez and Chair and Judge Harris, um, we will have a commission meeting then where we'll start talking about regulations. So that's other part of the commission is that they set the rules and regulations for the two boards as well as how investigations are done inside of OPAT. So those meetings will start going. We also will have. Um, meetings set for the two boards so we can start doing the work. So literally when I say we're going to start doing the work, we're doing the work. So we have some dates that we're going to hopefully start having meetings every month because they are by mandate. Both boards are to meet four times a year, which puts us basically on a schedule once a month. So that's what you can expect is that we'll start having hearings. We do have on our website, as the mayor said today, um, we did start updating our website so that there are some complaints that we have received since we started accepting complaints. And we're also going to start trying to do a get to know OPAT. Where we're going to do some grassroots efforts, um, as the mayor said, getting City Hall out of City Hall to let the community know what we actually do. A lot of people don't know what OPAT does and how they can actually file complaints and not have to go to the police station, but actually go to another entity to unburden themselves of their experiences with the police. Are both boards now? Are there any empty seats? They're both filled. 14 members, five on the Eternal Affairs Oversight Panel and nine on the Civilian Review Board. Mm -hmm. Director Everett, have you set a goal date for when everyone starts actually hearing the cases that have come to you so far? So we're hoping, so we will have a retreat with everyone in March. There was some training, so some of the members that were appointed over the summer, um, they went through a training already. Um, there's another, the next group will start their training the end of next month, and then we have a retreat set. So we already have dates set. Um, so we're starting the work immediately. In terms of case review? So for case review, um, the investigations take, we have to start the investigations. So the post commission, the state's version of us, um, in a way, they set a 12 month timeline. And so we don't think that we're better than anyone else. So we also set a 12 month timeline. So we eternally are looking at cases. So we will start looking at cases. They'll get cases as that goes on, but there's policy work that needs to be looked at as well. So that work will begin. So they don't just look at cases, they also look at internal policy work. So all of that stuff will begin immediately. Ms. Mack. I'm going to speak in both language. The Junta Directiva, how va a ayudarte como la alcalde para educar para que esto cambie, no solamente escuchar las quejas, ¿verdad? Eh, ¿Cuáles son los planteamientos? ¿A quién se le va a preguntar los planteamientos? Como madre de, de jóvenes, yo digo que la mentalidad de los jóvenes está contaminada de cosas que ellos no saben, solamente escuchan. Entonces, 
¿Cómo van a hacer para que los jóvenes participen? Mm. Okay, es, es muy importante no solamente crear la existencia de una solución o, o recurso, pero uh, la educación y la comunicación directamente con la comunidad. En la creación de estas juntas, será, uh, uh, estaba muy importante de, de, sele de seleccionar los miembros directamente de la recomendación del Consejo Municipal y también de organizaciones comunitarias. No, no estaba un, un proceso de una persona que uh, de, de um, sus amigas o otras conexiones, pero verdaderamente un proceso creado de la comunidad y en, en, um, amplificada con la, lo, los um, representantes de la comunidad también. Y era, um, estaba muy importante también de especialmente crear una posición, una, una apuesta directamente a representar los jóvenes. Entonces, uh, la señorita Carey uh, es la representante de, de jóvenes en Boston y, y más también. Do you want to say anything about, the question was about how do we make sure to create um, not only the board but direct access and to involve young people in this? Or any other board members too? Okay. Sorry. Basically, how do you involve uh, uh, the teenagers or the young people who are hearing things and not getting the right education, just hearing things? Mm. So what is the plan? Yeah, I definitely think, one, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think it's about really meeting young people where they're at. Um, you know, I've worked at Teen Empowerment for over seven years, and literally the model is youth and adult partnerships working together to make collective change in their communities. Um, and I think especially like the, the role that adults play is to support the platforms of young people and amplify their voices. So um, one thing I'm thankful for is my parents. They're always checking in with me. How do you feel about this, right? And also being in tune with their life and what's going on in social media because young people are very involved, you know. Um, they are the architects of social media. Everything they see, they're internalizing all of these messages, but nobody's having conversations with them or nobody's listening like you said. Um, so I think what's important is for, one, bring the, din the dinner table back um, and really have some conversations with your kids or any young people that you have in your life. And it all goes, goes back to the simple question of, what do you need from me? And I'll tell you what I need from you. Perfect. So. I have the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I want to make sure... Oh, sorry, There's, uh, we want to add more on this question. Perdón, que quería um, decir una, una opinión también. Como trabajadora social, creo que hay programas que necesitamos crecer solamente, no solamente en la casa, pero en la escuela. La problema ahora con, con servicios de salud mental es que no tenemos suficiente ayuda para los parentes en la casa. Entonces, lo que pasa es que es, normalmente tenemos como un tratamiento, un plan de tratamiento de salud mental, pero los madres, las mamás, la, los papás también, no tienen este apoyo de entenderse exactamente cómo apoyar este tratamiento de salud mental. Entonces, mi oficina está creando o una oportunidad de colaborar con uh, Boys and Girls Club, que tienen un programa que se llama Youth Connect. Entonces, tenemos una colaboración con la Departamento de Policía para crecer esa conexión de la casa y la escuela y también con policía para crecer este como una relación que podemos confiar en uno a otro en nuestra comunidad y también comunicarse qué lo está pasando en la comunidad. Gracias. Just, just to add to um, Chris Sumner to that question, um, a lot of this was covered in the interviews. Um, as you can see, there's a seamless line of intergenerational uh, leadership here. And part of the interview, at least for me personally, was that there were these intergenerational uh, processes uh, as leaders. Um, and so it was a great question, but I know that I came on board because of the, the nature of how comprehensive the interview was, how considerate it was about making sure that we have an inter seamless intergenerational uh, concept in leadership. And so, as my sister said, um, everybody that's on this panel is either one to two or three degrees of separation from a young person
that's deeply and greatly impacted not only systemically or institutionally, but personally. So your question is on point. Thank you. And I'll just add, as uh, one of the original sponsors on, on the ordinance that led to the creation of this, this was really important to us, uh, as uh, Carrie Mays eloquently said, but also Judge Harris shared that his experience with an officer was at the age of 12. Uh, Ms. Carruthers shared that her experience was in high school. We know that many of the folks uh, in the city of Boston that are having interactions with officers are often youth, are often folks who are between the ages of 12 or 13 all the way up to maybe 30 but are in that area of youth uh, where those impacts, uh, often they feel like they can't have those conversations. I personally have had interactions with officers, both good and bad, and those interactions generally happened in my youth. And so the plan here, and, and I think it was a specific part of the OPAP board, was to have a youth seat, which Carrie Mays is our youth member, and I think we all see we couldn't have done better than this. And so, you know, that's a high bar, but we wanted that because youth voice is important and youth engagement is important, and that intergenerational aspect of this is widely important because if we don't have a way to think like youth and to connect with youth, then we're not going to have the buy-in that we need to make this work. And so that is something that we've been very intentional about, that the mayor had, couldn't have done a better job in her selection here, and we're very excited about the fact that that's an aspect of the Civilian Review Board, which is something that I think will serve as a national model for how to really do this. So we're excited about that, and that's something that we took to heart and put into the, the process of creating this. Um, Mayor Liu, um, I understand that a state appeals court has halted the vaccine mandate for city workers. Uh, what happens now? We are working closely with all of our union partners and continuing to ensure that we're seeing vaccination rates go up. As of today, we are at a 95% vaccination rate across the city workforce, and that number has been increasing even over the last couple of days. The vast majority of our city workers have already taken this important step. We are, if you compare the, the uh, employees of the city of Boston to almost any other group across the country, 95% vaccination is something to celebrate, and we want to close the rest of that gap. So. We will continue at this, and as our uh, many other major employers have done so in the public health and public safety of our residents and workforce in, in a time of pandemic, we will continue to work towards full implementation. How does this change city policy, or does it? We are, uh, we're gonna evaluate what the, I haven't read the, the specific ruling yet, so we'll evaluate and huddle on, on what the next steps exactly mean, but we're still on track in terms of our timeline to, to um, close the vaccination gaps across the city. The clinics specifically for city workers have been going very well even this week, and it is important and necessary for public safety and health that we get this done. Yeah. What's your reaction to the BPPA vote yesterday? 95% of our police department is vaccinated already as well. And so I'm incredibly grateful to the vast majority of officers who have already taken the step. It is unfortunate that we hear conspiracy theories and anti-vax ideology shaping the debate, spreading misinformation, but this is something that is necessary for those who are working with the public in this moment. Our healthcare workers are entirely vaccinated, our state, government has moved towards full vaccination and the city of Boston has to be a leader here as well. Thank Mayor, you everyone. On a, on oh, a yep. different subject, uh, snow is coming this weekend. Uh, did you talk about the preparation? Any, uh, you know, are you gonna declare a storm emergency, park in advance? Yeah, we're monitoring very closely and I think we're going to have, we're most likely going to have a um, specific press event about this tomorrow, but the forecasts are showing uh, 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 pr the forecasts are predicting pretty heavy snow, and so this may end up being the first snow emergency that the city has in 2022, but we are ready. We're feeling good about the staffing and the workforce that's available. We were very, very proud of how the first storm uh, was handled just a few weeks ago, and so we're going to ratchet that up a little bit and uh, get back to you tomorrow with our exact preparations. Last question. Can you say that in Spanish also? Sí, ok. Um, en, en anticipación de um, el, el, uh, uh, <laughs> 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 mañana, ok. 
nevada. Muchas personas en este, en este uh, cambio eh, 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 más preparadas de, de mí, um, en anticipación de un, un atormento de nieve, um, la ciudad y todos los miembros de los de departamentos de um, Public Works y, y uh, de la calle, so Streets Cabinet, estaba, uh, estamos en preparación. Um, mañana tenemos un, una um, conferencia sobre los detalle, detalles de esa situación, pero et, uh, estoy muy agradecida a todos los miembros de, de esos departamentos para la preparación y um, eh, tenemos, uh, tengo la confianza en, en nuestros esfuerzos y en la preparación. Gracias. Thank you, everyone. No, I didn't see that either. It's just that I felt good.